Welcome back. Welcome in. This is Country Roads Confidential at earsports.com, a CBS Sports podcast. My name is Mike Casaza, coming to you live from um, above Mountaineer Field, site of, well, Chris Anderson, a pretty entertaining, pretty competitive, pretty predictable, and if you're the home team, pretty deflating game. Number seven, TCU enters and departs undefeated with a 41-31 win. Um, touchdown pass at 20 seconds left opens it up a little bit but a pretty eventful well first half and then second half that became pretty compelling too just another day of the office for the Mountaineers yeah absolutely and and so much of this and this game and what happened was a microcosm of the season and maybe the Neil Brown era and we'll talk about some of that stuff here in a bit but um yeah, just a, a, a two wildly different halves. First half, offense, offense, offense. Second half, nobody can really get anything going. Um, but again, that's that's something we'll talk about here in a minute. That 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 has become a recurring trend. Neil Brown's seat. Um, I don't know. Whatever. It's it's a results business. They're three and five right now. They have to win four before they lose two to be bowl eligible. Given the amount of bulls that are out there now, bull eligibility seems like the basement level for your career ladder, I would think. But you really can't be disappointed with performance, especially when you overlap it with what you saw last week. Um, in particular, the second half against Texas Tech. West Virginia flat offensively, excuse me, flat defensively in the first half here compensates with the offense. Second half a bit different. Not the best offense. Kind of got outflanked up front by TCU's defense, but the West Virginia defense answered, played hard, made plays, and kept the lid on things enough for the offense. Had it been a little bit more effective, a little bit more productive, who knows how this turns out. I'm thinking in particular of two possessions that end up with three total points in the shadow of TCU's end zone against an offense like that that can score as quickly as often as the Horned Frogs do. Three points when 14 is attainable in the goal. Well, that looms pretty big in a 10-point loss. Let's go right to it then on that, because that's one of the things, one of the the things that I have highlighted on my little notepad of what to talk about was one of those trips. Officiating conspicuous here. It begins with, I don't know what you call it. It seemed to me at first blush, like catch interference. In fact, uh, a person sitting next to me in press row said that might actually be targeting because the collision was so physical and so fast, it seemed egregious and they would throw a flag instead it ends up as a turnover for West Virginia it's reviewed I don't know how many things were reviewed and for how long but I came away from the replays thinking that Bryce Ford Wheaton had pushed an opponent and a teammate into the punt returner that made the punt impossible to catch um, I don't know what penalties are anymore so I'm just going to stop guessing here but that was an omen because that goes West Virginia's way you combine the penalties that TCU continued to hurt themselves with in the first half and some of the second and you're starting to think yeah this is how it happens this is how a 7-0 team takes a loss on the road when quirky things like this pop up West Virginia ball going into the uh, TCU end zone it's right there for a touchdown and a big momentum boost yeah on that on that fumble non-fumble penalty non-penalty I I can't wait to ask my father-in-law about this again I think I mentioned it before that he he's an official that has done college games high school games um that I feel like my initial response is at start that was Bryce Ford Wheaton, Wheaton blocking a TCU player into the back of a WVU player who then went into the punt returner. That part was not a penalty, but the ball didn't touch the punt returner there. It bounced and kept going. And here's where I think West Virginia caught a break because I believe it was X-Ray Lowe who shoved the TCU player which caused the TCU player to then hit the ball, which then West Virginia recovered. Uh, You obviously need the returning team to touch the ball before you can recover a punt, but you cannot push a returning, a returning return team player into the ball to cause contact. And while it seemed like, you know, that was just them rumbling to go get the ball, thinking that it was already a fumble. I think maybe the correct call here was, uh, you know, a penalty on X Low for shoving into the or not penalty or whatever it is, just a dead ball right there. Uh, and it should have been TCU ball. But whatever, like you said, it ended up being West Virginia's ball. They hustled after it. They got it. That one ends up in a field goal. 
Uh, I believe that was they started inside the 20, didn't get inside the 10, but it was the next drive that was just so alarming to me because the first three drives, and I even I live tweeted it out on that first drive where West Virginia had first and goal, I believe it was like the two yard line, three yard line, and went CJ Donaldson run, CJ Donaldson run, CJ Donaldson run, touchdown. And I said, just excellent restraint from Graham Harrell there to not get cute and just just score the touchdown. Just if you run CJ Donaldson enough in short yardage situations, he will get across the goal line. Second drive, when West Virginia's plays inside the 10 yard line, Justin Johnson Jr. run, CJ Donaldson run, CJ Donaldson run, touchdown. Third touchdown drive, Justin Johnson run, CJ Donaldson run, Justin Johnson play action pass to him, touchdown. So you're like, this this is working. This is working. Run the ball. You are owning the line of scrimmage. You have big, hard running backs. Run the ball. They get down in inside the 10. Again, four downs to try to get in the end zone. And they go jet sweep to Bryce Ford Wheaton. Ooh. And first of all, jet sweep, you know, became famous for guys like Tavon Austin. Bryce Ford Wheaton is not Tavon Austin. Like they are, could not be more different of wide receiver. Like other than, other than the fact that they are listed as wide receivers, they have nothing else in common. Um, second play QB draw to JT Daniels, who I don't recall having ever run a QB draw. That was the Spanish inquisition. You never suspect that one. <laughs> and then corner fade, corner fade. So my comment after the first drive of, Wow, great restraint not getting cute. It was like three, four drives worth of cute goal line plays all jammed into one, and it was a disaster on that drive. Third down play is spilled milk. I'm I'm, I'm going to say if they look at that one again, that probably should have been a handoff and a run into the middle. Uh, there's something that goes on with Brian Palendi and Ford Wheaton on the left side. I thought maybe Palendi was blocking or something like that, which made me think that could have been a run play. It's a fade to the back pylon. Um, a lot of room for it, but like the sideline seemed like they were not happy with that. Um, so that was probably not what they wanted. Fourth down plays what we're going to talk about, I guess, huh? It's um, another goal line fade. Um, this time to the short side of the field. They had had that play action rollout that looked really good when they were down in a similar spot on the touchdown pass to Johnson. They have slants that work you can run rubs and picks you could run screens you can run bubbles back to back fades there in a game where you really when they were at their best offensively or defensively they were forceful they were aggressive they were physical they went and got it and this one is like let's just kind of pluck it out of the sky it seemed incongruous but i think what people are probably going to be most upset about was that was an awful handsy play by the defensive back um, who just had his numbers facing Daniels the entire time. Didn't seem like he was playing the ball too much. More adamant than I've ever seen Brown before. Uh, wanted pass interference. There were probably 50,000 of the people that wanted the same. And can't say I disagree. Again, officials conspicuous in this one. Yeah, they had some questionable calls. And in, uh, to be honest, on me, that might rank like seventh on the questionable calls. Because, yeah, I think – he didn't turn around to play the ball. He did. He just straight turned his back to the quarterback and had his hands out. I didn't think the contact was that egregious, but he was, you see refs call it so often because he simply just didn't play the ball. He didn't play the pass. He didn't do anything. He just kind of turned his back to JT Daniels, put his hands out on Caden Prather and then turned around and acted like he played great defense. And I'm not sure he did. It was again, a little handsy. Uh, it was a, Bad pass, I think, from Daniels. There was there yeah. was no touch on that. It was just a straight line drive, um, high line drive, like not even a back shoulder one. So a very bad pass. Um, Prather didn't even really have a much of a chance at it. So it's just not that whole trip. It was all four of those plays inside the 10-yard line. And you go back and you look. I've already put up the plays that changed the game with the win probabilities. Them not being able to convert right there lower their chances of winning by almost 25%, which is a considerable, considerable amount when it comes to that win probability index. Worst case scenario for West Virginia, you think your defense is playing better. You're going to make TCU go 96 yards, which I could take all of, I don't know, three snaps maybe, the way that things were going. But I understand the idea there. 
TCU darn near does it. They have to go 96. They go 95. They convert on a third and one right away. Uh, that's after Quentin Johnson drop. They convert on a third and 13 where they get a 10-yard completion on a traditional running back screen pass. Charles Woods makes a great play to cut that down. You think, hey, might be a field goal here, right? No, TCU stays in the field, and then it's a duel, Chris. It's Quentin Johnson against Charles Woods in a one-on-one, um, and it's just a quick, am I going to go deep? Nope, I'm going to go slant, catch it first down. They get the ball down to the one on a run and a face mask penalty. It's first and goal in one when we start the fourth quarter, and it just seems like this is going to be 35-24. TCU is going to be in the left lane passing West Virginia soon. Inspired by West Virginia's play calling, Garrett Riley gets very <laughs> creative with his, with um, I, I, a darn near a turnover. I don't think that got enough attention, but like that was an extremely goofy, clumsy, but uh, it turns out a droid play by Quentin Johnson to, I think, scoop up a fumble, yeah. you know, almost score. And then he gets an end around, an end around in a goal line formation on third and goal from the one, loses 11 yards. Riley Collins finds himself right place, right time, makes the play, and they end up kicking the field goal. But I think what, what would have lost this game for TCU was its inability to get short yardage conversions, none larger than right there. Absolutely not. Big play by Riley Collins. I, I saw 32 earlier, and it, honestly, it was a really bad pursuit angle into the backfield on an earlier play, like early in the first quarter, maybe second quarter. And I thought, wait, is that red shirt, red shirt lifted, I guess? Or, I mean, he's still got four games, could do four games, but looks like he's going to be getting more playing time here. Um, and then really stepped in on there. I saw him in on a, on a couple other plays, but kind of just where West Virginia is in the secondary right now, that, that a true freshman, another true freshman getting in, replacing an, another true freshman that was out and Jacoby Spells and other guy. I mean, I know they don't play the same position, but again, you're, you're losing one true freshman, bringing in another true freshman, so on and so forth, moving it up and down the line. Hey, Mike, can we, I'd like to spend a little more time I don't want to say big picture, but, you know, I mentioned like this was a microcosm of maybe the season and the Neil Brown era as a whole. Mm -hmm. I'd like to expound on that. Can we do that yet? Uh, If you weren't going to, I was going to do it on the next drive, but go for it. Because this seems like I think we made the analogy on Tuesday's podcast or Thursday's podcast where I talked about all I'm thinking about are those cartoons where. A, a, a hole comes through where there's a leak and the cartoon guy, the, you know, the cat, Tom, Tom and Jerry, whatever. can't remember which one's Tom, which one's Jerry. He sticks one finger into the hole and then another leak comes out, sticks another finger. And next thing you know, he's got six, eight, 10, 12 fingers trying to plug all these holes that are coming up. And that's what I feel like is happening. This, like this game, the season, this, all of the Neil Brown era. Cause it seems like every time there's a problem with, with a position, an area, that part gets fixed, but then another problem pops up somewhere else and another problem pops up somewhere else. It, the run game, it's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. Boom. All of a sudden it's amazing. But now this is the problem. Oh, the offensive line. It's terrible. It's terrible. Now it's great. I mean, they were good today. Very good. I thought. Yeah. And, and that was not your, you know, they were rotating in, you know, Doug, James Gamitter was already out. Wyatt Milan's hobbled. Doug Nestor has to step in, or Doug Nestor's out. So Jordan White, who was already replacing Gamitter, was then moved over to right guard to replace Nestor. And then Jordan White goes out. So all of a sudden you have a guy who has moved from left tackle to right tackle, moved back in to play right guard. And they were fine, yeah. like better than fine. Like, again, good. But now that you got the offensive line fixed, it's what everybody's complained about for three years. That's fixed, and now the problem's the secondary. When West Virginia had maybe the what was it the best number one pass defense like two two years ago mm-hmm. was solid. The other times now the secondary is a problem. You fix one spot there, and then there's a problem over here. And I don't know if that's just the nature of this college football game, or you know you turn a blind eye to things that you think are good, and then they get bad quickly. But this is what it feels like with the roster, and then you look at the game today. Offense is flowing, just moving the ball, easy peasy. Defense is the worst, I think, one of the worst halves I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, was it halftime, 28 points on 25 plays? And then the second half, they were, I mean, let's not go too far and say that they were very good or maybe not even good, but they held until the final the, that final little toss-up at the end, the number three 
offense in the entire country to six points in the second half. Again, he's trying to find wins here, but it was it was fine work. It was decent work. And that was that was the second half was winning defense. The first half was winning offense. But again, this is what it, this was kind of what I'm long way of saying. You're back to this problem again. First half, your offense is working. Your defense stinks. Second half, you get the defense fixed. Now your offense stinks. Why can it not just all work at once? Yeah, when you have problems, there's multiple plates spinning, you know. Yeah. But when things are going well, you, you can never get four tires going in the right direction. It feels like I, I yeah. just that's like you're right, and that is emblematic of a lot of struggles for a lot of programs, not just this one here. I think that was, I think that's probably the the takeaway here is that short term, long term problems have been solved. You know, long term things such as the running game. Short-term problems such as maybe the secondary in the second half. It, it was just better, but you couldn't get it aligned long enough and sustain it and get it across the finish line. That's a problem, too. Um, my microcosm, my long story short, my um, tight crop close look of the big picture is the drive that follows here. They um they get that goal line situation resolved. They get off the field. It's three points instead of seven. They're not down by 11. Things are good. The first play. Got a shot to Sam James. Um, slot, deep, separation. What did we talk about last week? Couldn't get open. Got a chance, and Daniels just misses. It's a good play. It's a good design. It's the right spot for it coming out of a quick change like that. You got some momentum. Hey, try to capitalize. Doesn't work. Second down, Daniels is sacked. Doesn't get sacked very often. They had his number a little bit with a little bit more pressure. They end up going three and out. And all of a sudden, like that, that air is out of the balloon. It's flying around the stadium real fast. And, and momentum's trying to pick a side, and it, it kind of has to side with the team that – Wants to do something with it, and West Virginia couldn't. And that was a bummer, I think, right there. Um, just that middle sequence there where they had a chance to do something and couldn't. They got some good fortune on defense, couldn't make it happen, and then had a chance to do something with their offense and couldn't. And you can just kind of see hot potato stuff, too, of who wants it, who can do something with it, who's used to doing it and who's not. It just seemed like it was all kind of unfamiliar and uncertain at that point, too. Uh, a question to you, Chris, though. I think you could understand, the devil could advocate, if you will, that it's hard to do a lot of things different and more aggressive on defense when you're rotating in so many new parts in the secondary in particular. That was the most I'd seen them play man to man. They blitzed a bunch. They pressured a bunch in that second half when they were like a skeleton crew. Um, Naeem Muhammad's playing spear. They're, they're just playing two corners, really uh, Ruffins in there and woods who knows how good those guys are going to be long-term and they get stretched out because woods is coming back and Ruffins lack of better phrases has been just a guy like a nice utility party can play different positions but they were better, and I wonder like how often that, oh, you can't do a whole lot if you got young people. I think they just made things very simple, like, hey, play fast, play hard, win your one-on-ones, and I think they were better in the second half. And I wonder how many problems they can solve by just saying, you got to give these guys a chance, stop trying to protect them, see if football players can play football. You are 100% correct with what I think happened in the second half. I mean, it, or I guess not 100% correct if I don't know it for a fact, but I believe the same things you believe. I believe that's why it got better was because they took that approach, which then, like, I'm not trying to be like some negative Nancy here, but it raises the question. Throughout the week, the coaching staff talked about, all right, screw it, we're, we're going to be more aggressive. We're going to play more, man. We're going to be more aggressive in the second year. We're going to be more aggressive on defense. And then they came out and rushed three and dropped eight and played soft coverage. And like, I mean, I know you're, you're there in the press box. I'm watching home on TV. I mean, the guy on the uh, the in the announcer booth, the analyst, was just ripping them apart. It was like that's the, that's way too soft a coverage for eight drop dropping eight. Yeah. Like you can't if you're going to drop eight, you should be playing tighter coverage. And West Virginia just wasn't doing it. So I wonder. I I, I asked the question, why not in the first half? Why why do you wait until it gets burned 25 times before you switch when you already know it doesn't work? When you already said you were going to make that switch? I don't know how you can go back into the meeting room and say uh, on Tuesday when you game plan or Monday when you game plan and say, hey, second half's great. We're actually going to go back to the first half. We're going to turn the page backwards. How does that sound, guys? And they'll be like, yeah, cool, let's do it. I don't think it's what you want to do, especially if you're going on the road to play a team that's kind of offensively challenged. How bad was West Virginia's defense in the first half? Pretty bad, Chris. Touchdowns of 71, 55, 51, and 30 yards. Um, a 51-yard touchdown run untouched through the middle is kind of hard to do. Um, yeah, 28 points, 25 plays, 1.12 points per play. What if I told you, Chris, that uh, David Hartley tweeted me during the game and said that the Baylor game 
in 2012, the famous 70-63 game, mm-hmm. that defense only allowed .86 points per play in that game so by you know yeah by 0.26 more points per play that's how bad the defense was in the first half really good in the second half ultimately it comes down to a couple sequences at the end where if they just make one play offensively the defense is vindicated and things like good in the end it's a fourth and one play where tcu says i dare you to stop us extra low is a little bit too ambitious jumps off sides it's a free play malachi ruffin who had recovered the fumble punt who had an interception on maybe like an arm pump by duggan um, all of a sudden you're thinking, this is going to be a run play. What am I worried about? Savion Williams running toward the back pylon. Oh, my goodness, is the ball in the air. It's over my head. Touchdown. Um, that turns into a 10-point game. But here we are at the end talking about a play the defense didn't make when maybe some of the blame, some of the arrows should point at the offense here. Had chances, had possessions, did nothing with them, especially the one uh, right after the interception. I'm so glad you went this way because that was kind of – I mean, I don't know if you're – I don't know if I'm not trying to end the podcast right this second, although I wouldn't hate it, but it was where I wanted to end our conversation was on this very topic because I had someone who sits very close to the field, right behind the team, who texted me towards the middle of the second quarter that said that there was a lot of arguing, finger pointing, yelling screaming between the offense and defense that offensive players were getting in the face of defensive players essentially telling them make a play do something you know and and this this happens like when one side of the football is scoring a touchdown i mean west virginia went touchdown touchdown fumble touchdown in the first half and was losing by seven because the defense allowed touchdown 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 uh excuse punt touchdown 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 and they got into it a little bit, and I thought, oh, you know, maybe that was just a little little something. Who knows? Um, I know I messaged you about it, and then a couple minutes later, the ESPN sideline reporter hops on and talks all about it, and now it's something. Now it's making me think it's a little bigger than just some guys getting frustrated, and then you get into the second half, and it kind of flips because the defense, every time the defense made a play, made us play big stop fumble recovery defense or special teams here's what west virginia's offense did four plays for two yards after the fumble recovery get the stop on well it wasn't it was a field goal but they got that stop on third down when it was first and goal from the one they mm-hmm. got the stop the one you talked about and you talked about the next drive three plays negative nine yards they get the interception on that last play or the last second to last drive where west virginia gets it with, what, about two minutes left, three minutes left, with a chance to go down and tie or win the game, and the offense goes three plays, negative three yards. So that's three, six, ten plays for negative ten yards on three of the most crucial offensive drives of the game. Like, that's not acceptable. Like, that's that's what you're talking about here, about maybe that some of the blame's falling on the offense. And then I'm wondering, how much of this is, like, this is not, not infighting or something, but, you know, offense versus defense. And then it's just it's just a bad, bad mix right now. You've been in a rowboat before, Chris? <laughs> I have. Person in front of you is going one direction. You're going the other. What happens? You go in a circle. Yeah. And you just spin around and around and around. And I'm not sure this is going in a circle right now, if it's circling the drain, whatever. But you saw... They could not complement one another day at the right times. At times, it did work when they absolutely needed good offensive butchers, good defense. It didn't happen when they needed defense to get a stop because the offense had something going to get some breathing room. At least nothing really worked. Uh, that's a problem. Three and five right now, one and four in the Big 12 on the road against Iowa State. Offensively deficient team. Excellent defense. Keeps the, the lid on you here. So what can the offense do? Can the defense maybe gain some confidence for the stretch run? Simple math right now. Need to win three before you lose two um easier said than done with the schedule coming up i'm looking at the kansas state oklahoma state score right now that is surprising both teams are still on west virginia's schedule um i don't want to say you can't lose the iowa state game because here's a team that hasn't been very good in the row but that that does shape up to me maybe a must win with two more home games left got the work cut out for them effort good today outcome not and i think you're right i think it boils down to critical moments by the offense where this team has waited for the defense to do something good for a while. It happened in patches today, but it happened and unresolved uh, 
result, I think, for what maybe could have been. Absolutely. Now I got to turn around, get ready. Like I said, we'll be back for another regular week, and, and the schedule does not get any easier. Um, see what uh, happens over the next couple of days because a couple of more players, I already noted Jordan White, but uh, Davis Malinger also down. CJ Donaldson went down twice, uh, came back from the first one, obviously, second one down. So I, I don't know if this team's going to get any healthier, and it's not going to get the schedule's not going to get any easier. Keep, keep an eye on Mallinger and Donaldson. Those do not look good, according to Neil Brown. Those could be long-term season injury. Season ending, we'll see. But that's something to pick up on Tuesday when Neil Brown has his news conference. Get ready for Iowa State. Always a crazy one in Ames. This one should be no different, I guess. Both teams really need one. We'll see who wants it more. We'll see how the Mountaineers prepare when we meet again. Until then, I'm Mike Casazza. And I'm Chris Anderson. We'll talk to you then.